In this animation, we explain why healthy walking involves rotating your feet slightly inward, and why walking in shoes can cause damage and pain. We also look at how we can run healthy and correctly. Damage and pain to the hips, knees, and spine are common today in both older and younger people. Our current walking style with shoes is certainly one reason for this. Therefore, we show how this occurs and offer support for those suffering from pain, but also for those who are health conscious. From around the age of four to five, healthy children who learn to walk without shoes walk exactly the way we have for thousands of years. The feet are rotated slightly inward and moved at close distance to each other. Shoes, however, require different movement patterns when walking and running. For this reason, children who wear shoes often move in different movement patterns. As a rule, people maintain this gait pattern into adulthood, even if they walk barefoot. Let's take a look at the individual injuries caused by unfavorable walking movement patterns. The lower extremities, just like the other bones in the human body, are connected by joints. We can see that the pelvis makes wide movements when the feet point slightly outward and the knees are far apart. This is not the case with internal rotation of the feet and closed knees. More or less pronounced hip rotations are also usually necessary, which must be compensated for with the help of the arms. From the side, differences in rotational movements of both gait styles are clearly visible. A view from above makes it even clearer. Since the pelvis is directly connected to the spine, these unnatural movements can lead to spinal damage. The green line shows the tilting movement of the pelvis. During natural walking, the pelvis remains in an upright position. When walking with shoes, the pelvis usually tilts forward. If the person then tries to straighten up, they have to act against the pelvic movement, resulting in a hollow back. In a direct comparison, we clearly see the different spinal shapes. The tilting of the pelvis occurs because the body's center of gravity is shifted outward forcing the body to perform a compensatory movement. The further the body's center of gravity deviates from the green midline, the more the pelvis tilts forward. This can easily be verified by straightening the upper body and then walking with your feet pointed inward. As soon as you turn your feet outward while keeping your upper body straight and relaxed, strong pressure builds up in the rear pelvic area, causing the upper body to bend forward. However, problems are not only caused by a forward tilt of the pelvis. It also tilts to the side for compensation purposes and also performs twisting movements. These tilting and twisting movements can place excessive strain on the last two lumbar vertebrae, as the lumbar vertebrae are designed to absorb loads in a more vertical direction. This, along with a hollow back, can lead to overload in the lumbar region, which can initially cause pain and ultimately herniated discs. Much more information on herniated discs and other topics can be found in the corresponding animations on this channel. Over the course of evolution, our femurs, in particular, have become aligned inward to prevent such damage from occurring when walking. In contrast, apes have femurs that run straight downwards. The knock-knee posture seen in humans is absent in apes, which causes their center of gravity to shift much more outward when walking on two legs. The same is true for humans. The center of gravity generally needs to shift outward when we use shoes to walk around. The reason for this is simple and can be explained very easily. Because we have been practicing upright walking on two legs for thousands of years, we have certain movement patterns that are firmly anchored in our nervous system. When walking naturally without shoes, the foot automatically moves to the side and immediately returns to its natural position. No conscious muscle effort is required for this. The knee also remains in its original position and is not rotated. 
Our nervous system, therefore, maneuvers one foot around the other extremely efficiently and completely automatically so that they do not collide. After this, the foot returns to its natural, completely relaxed position. This automatic movement sequence, however, is designed for walking barefoot and generally does not work with shoes. Because shoes cause the foot to take up more space, the feet would constantly bump into each other, and the person would fall over their own feet. For this reason, we generally have to shift our feet outward. This prevents the feet, or rather the shoes, from bumping into each other. The weight and stiffness of shoes, sandals, or boots also have a noticeable influence on our gait pattern. This can result in the observations and damages to the spine mentioned earlier. But there are not only problems when it comes to the spine, since other problems can also arise for the hips, knees, and feet. We can clearly see that with slight internal rotation of the feet, the knees point straight ahead. Otherwise, the knees point outward and not forward. In order to understand better the problems that can occur because of this situation, let's take a closer look at the knee and its possible movements. The knee is a modified hinge joint with cartilage that serves as a gliding surface. It is called a modified hinge joint because it permits flexion and extension, as well as inward and outward rotations. However, major rotations are only possible when flexed, as the surrounding ligaments limit rotational ability when the knee is straightened. We can therefore see that the knee functions as a hinge joint when walking. In this respect, the knee joint functions optimally along the direction of movement. In all other knee positions, the forces do not act evenly on both cartilage parts. The goal should therefore be to position the knee so that the pressure in the joint is evenly distributed. We can clearly see that during natural walking, shown here on the left, the knee is in its optimal position. The hip joint, the knee, and the center of the foot form a straight line. This means that the body's weight is evenly distributed across the cartilage surfaces in the hip joint, the knee, and the foot. During today's common walking style, shown here on the right, the body weight is not evenly distributed. We can see that the knee points outward and tilts to the side. This creates uneven and therefore unfavorable pressure on the cartilage surfaces. Since the body weight now rests more heavily on one side, the cartilage's ability to regenerate is limited, causing the cartilage to deteriorate and ultimately leading to osteoarthritis. Because the pressure on the affected cartilage surface decreases during natural walking, the cartilage can certainly rebuild itself if the natural gait is used as the method of locomotion. Numerous other problems caused by today's walking, such as pain and osteoarthritis in the big toe, can also be resolved. We can see on the left that during natural walking, not just one, but all toes bear the body weight. On the right, however, during unnatural walking, we can easily notice that the body weight is carried only by the big toe. This can lead to excessive strain on the big toe joints. Damages are exacerbated by excess weight or by running, as the pressure on the joints increases. Here, we can clearly see the differences between natural and unnatural running with shoes. Both knees point forward during natural running, allowing the knee to function optimally as a hinge joint. During unnatural running, the knees point outward, which places unfavorable pressure on the knee. To align the knee in the direction of movement, the ankle often leans inward. This allows the knee joint to rotate more in the direction of running, but this further increases the strain on the cartilage in the knee. On the left, the feet are close to the body center of gravity, meaning the entire foot supports the body weight, and the hips don't have to make wide movements. During unnatural running, the foot is further away from the body's center of gravity. This forces the hips to make wide movements, which must be compensated for by rocking movements of the arms. Push-off and rolling occur again over the entire ball of the foot and all toes on the left, while on the right, it occurs over the inner area of the foot and the big toe.
From the side, we see the different ways of striking the ground with the foot. Without shoes, this occurs with the ball of the foot. With shoes, the landing occurs on the heel. The simultaneous forward movement of the hip and the landing of the heel causes strong pressure in the foot, knee, and hip joints. During natural running, we see that back and hips are straight, and a smooth landing on the ball of the foot cushions the forces acting on the joints. Because we've been walking upright for thousands of years, every fiber of our body is geared towards walking, but not with shoes. Those who wear shoes have to concentrate on placing their feet, otherwise their feet will hit each other. In addition, many muscles throughout the body must be constantly contracted. Sciatica pain and problems throughout the back and shoulder area due to constant tension are a common result. In natural walking, however, only the thigh is lifted. The body performs all other movements independently. It is therefore very important to completely relax the entire body, especially the pelvic area, and to concentrate solely on briefly tensing the thigh muscles so that we do not work against, but with our body. This also applies to running. We should try to completely relax our body while running so that the body can do its work. Only the arms are bent and the thighs are alternately moved upwards. And the coolest thing ever is, we don't need to pay attention to our feet as they perform all the movements independently. When all muscles except the front thigh muscles are relaxed, the body also takes over the lateral positioning of the feet. When walking naturally with a relaxed and straight back, the feet are automatically close to the body's center of gravity. As soon as we stop, the thighs and thus the feet automatically move outward for a secure stance. One of the reasons for this is the position of the upper body as well as the pelvis. When upper body and pelvis tilt forward, our feet move outward. When the pelvis straightens up again, the feet shift inward. In fact, as soon as our upper body is no longer sitting straight on the pelvis, it tries to restore balance. That is why, among other things, the inert mass of our upper body causes the feet to move outward when we stop. When we take the first step again and walk forward, the pelvis tilts backward and the feet move inward. Since the position of the pelvis has a direct influence on the position of the feet, it is not possible to maintain a straight, stable back when wearing shoes. A hollow back, therefore, inevitably occurs when walking in shoes and the person tries to keep the back straight. The transition from unnatural to natural walking and running involves some hurdles. Further information on this, as well as numerous other animations on cancer, diabetes, evolution, and much more, can be found at evolutioninhealth.com.